Hi, this is Joshua Cooper, and I'm going to talk to you about pace mapping today. You know, my general philosophy about maneuvers and techniques in the EP lab is that in order to be masterful in using these techniques, you have to understand all the ins and outs and fine details about how they're done and what the limitations and pitfalls may be. Because only when you can understand how techniques and maneuvers can mislead you can you come to correct conclusions and avoid coming to false conclusions. In this presentation, I'm going to review initially some simple scenarios to describe how pace mapping is supposed to work, but then review many different other scenarios where pace mapping may give you a result or a finding that you could easily misinterpret. So let's get started. The first and most basic thing to understand is what exactly goes on at the site where a pacing electrode is placed against myocardial tissue and a pacing stimulus is applied. Most people have in mind that there's a circular or a hemispherical zone of depolarization and the wavefront propagates out in circular or spherical fashion from there. But actually that's not at all the case. It's much more complicated. Here's a picture of the stimulation of a sheet of myocardial cells uh, from a cathode which is usually the type of electrode that's used for pacing and notice it isn't a circle but instead it has a dog bone shape which is very interesting and it has to do with the orientation of the myocardial fibers that's why this is not a symmetric circular zone of depolarization notice also by the way that there are zones of hyperpolarization as well it gets more complicated when you think about the cathodal stimulus turning off or what happens when an anode is turned on or off with regard to a pacing stimulus. But we'll talk mainly about the cathode because that's what's used when pacing for the most part. The next point to understand is that the signal strength during pacing will depolarize a different amount of myocardial tissue and at the boundary of that depolarized tissue is where outgoing wavefronts will propagate from. So in this study in dogs, which validated and verified mathematical modeling of what was anticipated to be the shape and size of the zone of depolarization of myocardial fibers, you can see when a 1.5 milliamp stimulus is applied, you get this dog bone shaped zone of immediate depolarization. If you increase the amount of output to three milliamps, you'll get a larger sized zone of depolarization, sometimes referred to as a virtual electrode. And when you go up to five milliamps, it's even larger and seven milliamps even larger. So this is another extremely important principle to understand when we're talking about pace mapping. The greater the pacing output, the larger the volume of myocardium will be immediately depolarized adjacent to the electrode and wavefronts will travel starting from the edge of that zone of depolarization. Just to show you how that works, here is an image of an initial zone of depolarization after a cathodal stimulus is applied, shown here in red. And the times in milliseconds are shown in these dotted and solid lines emanating from there uh, in this fashion. You can see how a wavefront will travel out and the immediate zone adjacent to the electrode isn't so important with regard to its shape. It does maintain that dog bone shape a little bit, but it becomes more elliptical as the wavefronts uh, distance themselves from the initial point of depolarization. The speed of depolarization will vary depending on tissue properties and in particular the orientation of the myocardial fibers signals travel much faster longitudinally along myocardial fibers rather than transversely and this has to do both with fiber geometry as well as gap junctions which tend to be more localized on the ends of myocardial cells connecting one to the next end to end in a much better fashion than side to side. Pace mapping is a technique that's used in the EP lab 
and it's used in an attempt to locate the origin of an arrhythmia, whether that's single beats, PVCs, or a sustained arrhythmia, ventricular tachycardia. And here are the basic principles of how pace mapping is supposed to work. When you have PVCs or an arrhythmia, the ventricles are activated from the origin of that arrhythmia from one source. The wavefront then propagates away from that source across both ventricles, and it does so in the same way beat after beat, generating a QRS complex that looks the same from one beat to the next. When you stimulate the ventricles during pacing, the goal is to try to stimulate the same volume of myocardium that is initially stimulated spontaneously. Now that's virtually impossible because if the arrhythmia is coming from one or a collection of cells in the heart, we don't have electrodes that are that small to depolarize that small an amount of tissue. And we'll talk about the consequences of depolarizing a larger volume during pacing than initiates a spontaneous tachycardia during this presentation. And then the concept is that when you pace, assuming you do stimulate a similar volume of myocardium, that the wavefront propagates away from that pacing site in exactly the same way as it does during the intrinsic arrhythmia. And therefore, if you can replicate the shape of the QRS complex during pacing, the conclusion you would come to is that you must be stimulating the myocardium during pacing from the same site that it is originating during the native arrhythmia. And therefore, you've located the site of origin. And here's how this would look visually. So if this simple oval represents ventricular myocardium and you have a spontaneous beat that starts at the location of the star and the wavefront propagates out according to the principles of fiber orientation and everything we just discussed, you'll get a PVC of a certain shape. Now we've gotten pretty good at simply looking at the PVC and figuring out where in the ventricular muscle it must have come from, but in order to ablate, you need to pinpoint it with extreme precision. So let's say we put in a mapping catheter and we pace from a certain location. Now remember, we're mapping, so we don't know the site of origin of the clinical PVC. And if we pace from this site, we get a paced QRS complex that looks like this. Now it is similar, certainly in vector, to the clinical PVC, but the shape really is not the same. And in order to be right at the site of origin, you really want to replicate the QRS morphology in all 12 leads and it be precisely identical to that of the clinical beats. So this is not a good site. Let's say we then move the catheter and we pace from here, which by the way happens to be the site of origin of this PVC. If we do so and we generate a QRS that looks exactly like the clinical PVC, that tells us that in fact we must be located at the same site of origin of the PVC since we're able to exactly replicate the shape of the QRS when pacing from that site. An important consideration with regard to pace mapping is the cardiac anatomy. It isn't always so easy that you can simply move the catheter a little forward or backward or left or right in order to more closely replicate the clinical beats and find the site of origin. For example, in the outflow tract, a relatively small volume of tissue is bounded by different chambers of the heart. And in order to pace map from different parts of that myocardium, you need to actually move the catheter to a totally different chamber and location in the heart. This is particularly true in the outflow tract region, where you can place a catheter and pace map from the right ventricular outflow tract, from the endocardial left ventricular outflow tract and aortic cusp region, from in the distal coronary sinus known as the great cardiac vein, which is, runs on the epicardial surface of the heart, and even sometimes performing a epicardial access, a puncture into the pericardial space to get a catheter to that location. Here you can see pacing from the right ventricular outflow tract, for example, gets you close to the clinical PVC, but it isn't right on the money. Similarly, when you go to the endocardium, the right coronary cusp, on the left side, 
the morphology isn't right either. However, if you move over to the left coronary cusp, you actually very closely replicate this clinical PVC. And that happened to, in this case, be the best pace mapping site, in particular when we're talking about trying to reproduce the morphology of the QRS in leads V1 and V2, which really didn't look right when we were pacing from nearby regions. This leads to the question of practically how do you compare the QRS morphology during pacing to the clinical beats, PVCs or ventricular tachycardia. And the most common way that people will do this is to simply have a template visible on the screen while you're pacing from different sites. So you'll have the clinical PVC, for example, on the left, showing you in all 12 leads what the QRS looks like. And then on the right, the live screen, as you pace map, you can compare that morphology to that of the clinical PVC. And it's helpful if all of the EKG leads are aligned so your eyes visually can compare horizontally. And in this way, you can look at every little bump and dip and peak of the QRS in all 12 leads to see if you've perfectly replicated the PVC clinically. Another way you can do this is taking advantage of software algorithms that mapping systems have. And in this case, they can overlay automatically the clinical PVC, and you need to, of course, make sure that you have stored in the system the correct morphology clinical PVC. And you can overlay on top of that the paste QRS morphology from different sites, and the system can give you a matching score. It'll tell you how closely the paste beat replicates the morphology of the clinical beat. In this case, you can see in green the native PVC and in yellow the paste morphology. And you can see they really don't overlap that well in multiple leads. In some of them they do, but in others they don't. And the system can give you a matching score. In this case, it's giving a score of 69% match, which isn't very good at all. If you move the catheter to an adjacent site and pace again, you can now overlay the new pace map on the clinical PVC, and you've gotten closer. The computer is telling us we now have an 87% morphology match, but you're still not replicating the clinical PVC that well. And if you move yet further, we can get a really close approximation between pace mapping and the clinical PVC, which we can visually see in the form of now yellow and green pretty much overlaying each other, again yellow being the pacing and green being the PVC template, and the computer is telling us at this site that we have a 99.5% morphology match, which is excellent. This, by the way, is a papillary muscle case, and I'm actually going to revisit this specific case later in the presentation when we start talking about some of the pitfalls of pace mapping and why it can be problematic in certain types of PVC and VT cases. There are many different considerations that must be taken into account when looking at the paste QRS morphology during pace mapping and comparing it to the clinical beats. The first one that I'll discuss is QRS fusion and stability of the pacing catheter. Here's a typical case where pace mapping is being performed. But when you go to compare the pace morphology to the clinical template, you're going to run into a problem because you're going to notice that there are two different morphologies of the pace QRS. And so the question then comes, which one should I use as the pace mapping morphology to compare to the clinical PVC? The answer here becomes pretty obvious once you look at the rest of the strip. Beats three and four replicate the second beat, and so that raises the question of why is this first paste beat of a different morphology? Well, in the practice of pace mapping, you're usually coming on and off pacing multiple times as you move the catheter from site to site, and it is very common to fuse the QRS with a native beat. If you look carefully, actually, you can see that there's a P wave here immediately preceding this paste beat, and therefore this QRS beat represents fusion between pacing and native conduction 
which is the underlying sinus rhythm. So it's important, first of all, when you're looking at pace mapping and comparing it to the template, that you have a pure paste QRS morphology and that it isn't fused with another PVC that's happening spontaneously or the underlying rhythm. So I like to see the same morphology of QRS over and over to verify that in fact this is purely a paste QRS morphology and isn't blended with something else happening at the same time. Another reason that you may see different QRS morphologies during pacing without moving the catheter is that the catheter tip may not be firmly opposed to myocardial tissue and may be bouncing around, especially considering cardiac and respiratory motion. So if you see a change in QRS morphology, it may mean that you need to get better tissue contact so that you're really pacing from one site. If you don't do that, then you might mistakenly be using one paste QRS morphology to represent a particular site, and it may not reflect pacing from the intended anatomic location. Let's start to get into the question of pacing a volume of myocardium that replicates as closely as possible the clinical origin of the beats or the tachycardia. And part of the issue here comes from the contact surface between the pacing electrode and the myocardium. Here we see a mapping catheter opposed to the surface of the myocardium. And if a pacing stimulus is applied, a certain volume of myocardium will be depolarized and wave fronts will travel outward in different directions from the edge of that virtual electrode. Notice I didn't draw a dog bone shape area of depolarization, but you understand the concept. If you use a different sized mapping catheter tip, such as this eight millimeter ablation catheter, you potentially may have a greater surface area opposed to the myocardium. Therefore, when a pacing stimulus is applied, you're potentially going to depolarize a different mass of myocardium that may configure to the shape and length of this electrode. When wavefronts travel out from the virtual electrode generated here, it may in fact generate signals in different directions or different starting points than was the case with a smaller electrode at that very same location. If we go back to the four millimeter tipped catheter, but now we consider the possibility that the anode, the second electrode, may be in close proximity or in contact with myocardium as well. If there is sufficient pacing output strength that both the cathode at the tip and the anode capture myocardium, you're going to potentially end up again with a different type of virtual electrode compared to capturing only at the tip. And now this zone of capture with the wavefronts that emanate from it may also not replicate a focal native tachycardia or PVC beat coming from that same location because of the additional myocardial capture. In practice, this ends up not being so much of an issue as has been shown in a couple studies, in large part because the catheter is often diagonally or perpendicularly opposed to the surface and the second electrode is not in good contact. And even when it is, it is in very close proximity to the tip with usually very close spacing with most mapping catheters that it practically usually doesn't make a difference. But it is important for people to be aware, especially at higher pacing outputs, that you may be capturing from two electrodes rather than one, and that may confound your interpretation of the paced QRS when comparing with native. The next pitfall to consider is how fast pacing is applied. When you have PVCs, there's usually a certain coupling interval at which they occur compared to the previous beat. And ventricular tachycardia usually has a pretty specific rate of a given QRS morphology. So the question comes, what if you pace faster or slower than those coupling intervals? Here's an interesting example of simply doing programmed stimulation from a catheter in the right ventricle as part of a basic EP study. The thing to notice here is what the QRS surface morphology looks like in the four leads that are displayed during the S2 and the S3 beats. Notice 
that during the drivetrain, the QRS morphology looks the same from one beat to the next. But once we get into the short coupled extra stimuli, notice in V1, we go from the same pacing location, instead of a left bundle branch block pattern, we go to a right bundle branch block pattern. And similarly in other leads, the morphology changes, even though we're pacing from exactly the same site. So the question comes up, why is this, that pacing from the same site can give you such a different QRS morphology? And the answer is, the faster you pace, you're potentially going to get areas of functional block areas of refractoriness where the previous beat didn't have a chance to depolarize in certain areas of myocardium. Remember the T wave has a certain width to it and if you start encroaching on the previous T wave during pacing it's possible that the wave fronts that you generate from pacing will not travel across the myocardial surface in the same fashion that they would if you allowed the ventricle to completely depolarize. So in general, it's a good principle to pace when you're doing pace mapping at the same coupling interval as the tachycardia or the same coupling interval that the PVC occurs to try to reduce any confounding of the morphology by pacing at a different rate and having wave fronts travel in a different fashion due to functional block or refractoriness. Let's get into the very important discussion about the strength of pacing output during pace mapping. We're going to actually revisit this again when we talk about myocardial scar. Now we're going to talk about pacing output in the context of normal myocardium. So let's start again with our simple ventricular model, this oval here of smooth myocardium. And here is our PVC focus radiating out in all directions from the site of origin. And let's try to use pace mapping techniques to locate this site of origin. If we place a mapping catheter here and we pace just at threshold, meaning if you turn down the output further, you'll lose capture completely. Then you're going to capture the smallest amount of local myocardium that you're capable of. If you turn the output higher, as we'll see in a moment, you'll capture a greater volume as we discussed at the start. So you'll capture that mass of myocardium and radiate outward in all directions and hope that you replicate the QRS morphology of the clinical PVC, capturing a similar volume of myocardium. What if you crank up the output to maximum? Well, now your virtual electrode, the tissue that you're going to depolarize instantaneously during pacing output is going to be much greater. And you're going to now start the wavefront in all directions from the edge of that captured myocardium. Now in normal smooth myocardium, this may not end up making a big difference in terms of the overall QRS morphology. So you capture another couple millimeters of myocardium that may not translate, depending on the local anatomy and topography, into any appreciable change in the way the bulk of myocardium in the ventricle is depolarized. However, unfortunately, the human endocardium is not smooth and is filled with ridges both in the right and the left ventricle. So let's say we have a PVC focus or a tachycardia focus that is near the endocardial surface, easy to ablate from the inside of the heart, and it's occurring at this location and creating a QRS traveling in this fashion in terms of the various wavefronts. So now we've placed a mapping catheter here on this irregular surface, right at the site of origin of that PVC. Notice it's in a crevice between two ridges, but the contact surface is right where the PVC was located. If we pace right at threshold, again, such that if you lower the output, you'll lose capture, we're hoping that you capture a very similar amount of myocardium in the region of the site of origin and then generate wave fronts that travel out from there that replicate the clinical PVC. But what if we increase the pacing output up toward maximum? Now you actually may capture more myocardium and not just in a circular fashion. Because you're near another ridge and because the myocardium is in motion during ventricular contraction, 
you may find that you capture a very different volume of myocardium at this higher output because of the irregular surface and how close your electrode may be to parts away from the clinical site of origin. And now, depending on fiber orientation and wavefront propagation, you may generate a QRS that looks different from the clinical PVC, even though your catheter remains at the appropriate ablation site. So the message here is, you should always, in every location, whenever you're pace mapping, turn the output down to threshold and evaluate the QRS morphology at that output level. This takes a little bit of time, but you get good at it by dialing up and down the output at each location, and it'll serve you well. You may notice no difference between a higher and lower output QRS morphology, but if you do, it's the lower output morphology that reflects the immediate tissue contiguous with the pacing electrode, which will then also serve as your ablation electrode. Here is a real life example showing that the cartoon I just drew isn't just from my imagination. This is a patient who had recurrent PVCs coming from the right ventricular septum. Recall that the right ventricle is particularly trabeculated. The ablation catheter is positioned here at the location of successful ablation, and note that it is between two myocardial ridges. The cathode, the tip of the catheter, during pacing is going to be in contact with one or the other or both of those ridges, which is a problem that is exacerbated by cardiac motion. If I freeze this image and highlight the ventricular myocardium in red, we can better appreciate exactly how the ablation catheter tip is located between ridges of ventricular myocardium within the right ventricle. The problem here is that different surfaces of the pacing electrode may be in contact with different parts of the myocardium or multiple places at once so that pace mapping may result in a fused QRS with wavefronts emanating from more than one location of contact, making it difficult to compare to the clinical PVC accurately. In addition, if you're pacing at high output, the QRS morphology that's generated may not as accurately reflect the key location where ablation will occur, which is going to be at the place of best contact. I want to go back and revisit, speaking of ridges, the pap muscle case that I showed earlier. Here's the ablation catheter positioned on the postromedial papillary muscle, and this was the location I showed earlier where there was a 99.5% match according to the computer algorithm that compared the pace mapping morphology to the clinical PVC. Notice as the catheter is moved just a little bit forward, just a few millimeters beyond where it was, suddenly you have a terrible pace map, a 69% match. And the question may be, why with such a small movement do you have such a vastly different paste morphology that no longer reproduces the clinical PVC? Let's again consider the surface topography here. Here we see the tricuspid valve, and we see a papillary muscle complex sticking into the left ventricular chamber. And I'll highlight that here in orange. And let's consider the rest of the myocardium here in red. If we have a clinical PVC that's coming from the pap muscle, such as here, it will generate a wavefront at the base of the papillary muscle and a QRS that is appropriate for that source of emanation. If we place an ablation catheter at the tip of the papillary muscle, so it's only in contact with pap muscle tissue, then when you pace from that location, you're also going to exit the papillary muscle complex in a very similar way that the clinical PVC did and thereby be able to replicate that morphology. If, however, the catheter is moved forward a little bit so that the side 
of the ablation catheter is in contact with the papillary muscle complex, but the tip or maybe the opposite side of the electrode is now in contact with the free wall or a different part of the myocardium, then now when you pace almost at any output, depending on the contact force at different locations of the electrode, you're gonna capture a very different mass of myocardium and have wavefronts that travel in a different fashion from simply capturing pap muscle tissue. So you might be really close to the site of origin, but because of the irregular surface and the pacing output consideration factored in as well, you may look like you're far away from the origin because of the lack of match between the paced QRS and the clinical PVC. Another situation that's relatively analogous in terms of an irregular surface of myocardium is in the aortic cusp region, which is a fairly common place that PVCs originate. If you look at the EKG and the intracardiac electrograms recorded from a mapping catheter here, you'll see a sinus beat followed by a PVC. And after the sinus beat, there is a sharp late potential and preceding every PVC beat, there's a very sharp early potential. So the question arises, what tissue is generating the electrogram seen here? Let's review the anatomy. So here we have a mapping catheter placed in the aortic cusp region. We can see the ventricular myocardium shaded in red. And the tissue that generates the PVC and also the late and early signals in sinus and the PVC beats is generally a finger-like extension of myocardium partway up the aortic root. Now the ablation catheter when placed in the well of a cusp is going to be adjacent to this finger of tissue because we're of course recording the little signal generated by that tissue, but on the opposite side and maybe in the well of the cusp itself, you may be also opposed to ventricular myocardium. So when you think about the sequence of activation during a PVC, you think about the site of origin being in this little slip of tissue and traveling down with a little delay into the myocardium and generating a wavefront out from there. However, if you pace from the ablation catheter, you may or may not replicate that exact same depolarization wavefront. If you pace at very low output and only capture that finger of tissue, then you may in fact replicate the PVC exactly. But if you pace at a little higher output, which may be the only output you can capture at this location, you may not only capture that finger-like tissue structure, but you may capture other myocardium as well and generate a very different wavefront from that site. Therefore, pace mapping from this location may also not be as reliable because of this reason. It's in areas of bend, it's in areas of irregular topography where the ablation electrode may oppose different tissue, not just the site of origin of a PVC or a tachycardia, where pace mapping can get less reliable and potentially confusing. Another situation where pace mapping may be problematic to locate the site of origin is when there is a PVC focus or a VT focus that results in stimulation of myocardium at multiple sites at once. And specifically, I'm referring to arrhythmias that come from within the Hisperkinji network. Here we have an example of fascicular ventricular tachycardia. There are a number of ways that we know this is the case, starting from looking at the QRS morphology on the surface, but the hallmark of fascicular VT comes when you put catheters in the heart and you can detect, as shown with the red arrows, a Purkinje potential that precedes every QRS and the His potentials, when there's wobble in the cycle length, lead the QRSs so you know that they are the first element to be depolarized. There are different ways to map fascicular PVCs and VT, and in large part it will depend on how frequent the ventricular ectopy is, how easy it is to induce ventricular tachycardia, and how well it is tolerated, meaning can it be mapped while the tachycardia is ongoing. If PVCs are not that frequent, or VT is hard to induce or not tolerated, 
then the first step is often to first map the left ventricular septum to find the location of the Purkinje potentials and the His bundle potentials. Here, red arrows are pointing to Purkinje potentials during sinus rhythm, and we know they're Purkinje potentials and not His bundle because they are late. This, the interval between that signal and the QRS is much shorter than the lower limit of normal for the HV interval, which would usually be about 35 to 40 milliseconds at the shortest. These are yet shorter still, suggesting we're further downstream the his Purkinje system than the his bundle itself. Here we have a three-dimensional map of the left ventricle with colored icons demonstrating locations on the interventricular septum where His bundle and Purkinje potentials were recorded. Here are some examples of each, and they were color coded by timing and location so that the earliest signals, which suggested His bundle recordings, were colored in orange. Purkinje potentials with a shorter signal to QRS interval were colored either purple if they were more on the anterior part of the septum or green if they were on the inferior part of the septum, suggesting that these perhaps were branches of the anterior fascicle and posterior fascicle respectively. This is what the his Purkinje system might look like if we were actually able to see it, and we've somewhat replicated it with these colored icons. What is unique about PVCs and VT that comes from the conduction system is that whether we're talking about a small reentry circuit or focal firing of a Purkinje fiber itself, when you have that mechanism active, because it is involved with the conduction system, you're initially going to get very rapid conduction out the ends of the local fibers, thereby stimulating the myocardium at multiple places at the same time, even if there is a single site of origin. So you generate generally a pretty narrow QRS morphology because of the relatively simultaneous nature of activating multiple sites and initiating multiple wavefronts. If you try to pace map at that site of origin, and here we've placed an ablation catheter and start pacing, you're often going to capture not just the local Purkinje fiber and exit out the same way that the native beats do, but you're also going to capture local myocardial muscle, which doesn't happen with the Purkinje initiated PVC. And so the pace map that you generate may be a blend or a fusion between local direct myocardial capture and the multiple exit sites of the Purkinje system, which you're also capturing. It's near impossible to capture just Purkinje fiber and not also capture local myocardium, even if you turn down the output. As such, when we're attempting to do pace mapping during fascicular PVCs or VT, you may replicate the QRS if you're at the right site, but you may not. Here's a perfect example of the latter, where we're seeing the fascicular VT on the left and pacing at the successful ablation site on the right. I've now highlighted just some of the EKG leads that show a very clear morphology difference between pacing at capture threshold and the ventricular tachycardia itself. So how do we explain the fact that the catheter is at the site of origin and yet at pacing threshold does not generate the same QRS? It is because you're also capturing local ventricular myocardium during pacing, which is not occurring during the fascicular VT. And therefore, you have a blend on every single beat during pacing, which does not replicate the ventricular tachycardia morphology. Don't be fooled. This is why fascicular VT and fascicular PVCs ideally are better mapped using activation mapping techniques, where you look for the earliest Purkinje potential during the early beats or the tachycardia itself and using that to guide ablation. Now we're getting to my favorite part of this talk, and in fact, the main reason why I created it. 
we're going to talk about myocardial scar and how that can greatly influence and confound the interpretation of pace mapping because of the way wavefronts travel through scar and exit to the rest of the myocardium. And we're going to start by looking at myocardial scar where different areas from within the scar exit at the same site. When you create a voltage map in the context of myocardial scar, it will look something like this. You'll have different colors that will denote the amplitude of the electrograms within that region. So for example, where you see an area of confluent red, that only tells you that all the electrograms within that region are below a certain amplitude. It doesn't tell you necessarily whether they are single or fractionated and complex, and it certainly will not tell you anything about signal propagation through that region. And so you'll get a false visual impression when you look at a color map like this, that a region of scar and low voltage is somewhat homogeneous because it's all colored the same. But in fact, if you were to zoom in and look at the tissue under a microscope, it's anything but homogeneous. It's going to be an extraordinarily complex, heterogeneous region of scar, fibrosis, myocardial fibers that conduct in very complex ways, connect to each other in yet more complex ways, and travel to the periphery of the scar at discrete and multiple locations where they connect with normal myocardium. And so if you use this color picture as a cue, when you're thinking about scar and circuits and reentry, you're not going to fully appreciate the complexity of what's happening when ventricular tachycardia is occurring and when you're pacing within this region of scar. Instead, you should think about the area like this, which reflects reality when you have scar, fibrosis, and myocytes intermingled with each other. It is only in this context that you can start to appreciate the phenomena that we're going to review regarding signal propagation through this region of scar and how QRS complexes are generated during clinical arrhythmias and during pacing. Let's think about reentrant ventricular tachycardia in the context of complex scar. It's pretty easy to imagine how a circuit can form when you have an intermingling of electrically inactive areas of scar and fibrosis with live and curved strands of myocardium intermingled between them. All you need is a way for signal to travel around a path where the conduction velocity is slow enough so that all parts of the path can recover before the signal reaches the start. That's the formula for ongoing sustained reentry. Here in this cartoon, for example, this could be a potential VT circuit trapped within the scar. How does that generate a QRS? Well, that signal will travel to whatever is the nearest electrical exit at the periphery of scar, and that's what will determine the shape of the QRS that results. If there were a different exit closer by, you'd have a different QRS from that same circuit, but whatever wins the race will determine the morphology. What if you place a mapping catheter in the circuit in pace? You may depolarize tissue and have that wavefront exit the scar in exactly the same way that the VT exited in which case you'll generate QRSs that will look exactly like the VT. And if you're well within the scar, there's often a delay between the pacing stimulus and the onset of the QRS. And we get very excited when we see this if we're pace mapping during sinus rhythm because we think, wow, if the VT exited in this fashion from within the scar, then I must be near or in the VT circuit as I'm pacing and it'll be a good place to ablate because I replicated the morphology, I have a long stem to QRS, and that's a very common combination of features that people will use to guide ablation when using pace map techniques. However, there are some pitfalls. 
What if instead we pace at this site here? This is an exit site. The ventricular tachycardia circuit sent a signal that reached the edge of scar at this location and exited to generate the QRS during tachycardia. And if we pace at this location, we're going to generate an identical or very similar QRS morphology because we will be activating the ventricles in exactly the same way. However, we'll notice that there is a short stim to QRS time because we're near the periphery of SCAR and there isn't a delay between the pacing stimulus and reaching the edge of SCAR where the beginning of the QRS starts. And that's a clue that maybe it isn't the ideal site. Now, of course, you need to use other mapping techniques, including entrainment mapping, to figure out if a pacing site is in a VT circuit but recognize that if you ablate at this type of exit site that isn't included in the circuit, you will not eliminate the VT because it will likely find another route to exit the scar. You'll change the morphology of the VT, but you won't eliminate the circuit and you won't eliminate inducibility of tachycardia. But what if you pace from over here, which has nothing to do with this ventricular tachycardia circuit, generates a long stimulus to QRS timing, and exits again at the very same place at the periphery of the scar? You might think when you see this same combination of exact QRS replication and long stim to QRS that this is a key place to ablate. And in this case, it would not be because you're at a bystander site that exits the same way but is not part of the machinery of the reentry VT circuit. Because of the complexity of SCAR, it is not at all uncommon to find sites like this where you can pace within SCAR, have a long stim to QRS, and perfectly reproduce the VT QRS morphology, but be at a site that is ineffective for ablating this VT. There are lots of potential imposter sites like this, and this demonstrates one of the pitfalls of using pace mapping in the context of SCAR as an exclusive mapping technique. If you're going to verify that you're within a VT circuit, the perfect way to do so would be to induce the VT and perform entrainment mapping using these other techniques to verify that your pacing site or your entrainment site in that case is within the VT circuit as opposed to a bystander. I'm going to show you some real world cases that demonstrate the principles that I'm drawing in cartoon fashion to show you that these really do occur and these concepts are very important to consider when pacing in areas of scar. This is a case of a patient who had a large anteroapical infarction. It was a case from many years ago, but demonstrates some of these principles beautifully, so I'm going to use it. Here we paced at these three sites. And notice on the right that the paste QRS complexes are nearly identical, not exactly the same, but very, very similar over a large territory around the periphery of this large scar. Why is that? Well, it is likely that at all three sites, the wavefront propagated within and near the border of the scar to a breakout exit site where it depolarized the rest of the myocardium in a very similar fashion, despite the fact that we're pacing at three very different locations. So this demonstrates the principle that the pacing site and the QRS morphology may not match, and they solely depend on how the bulk of the myocardium is depolarized, which may be adjacent to where you're pacing if the exit is nearby, or it may be remote. Here's a modification of the SCAR example that I just showed, but now the ventricular tachycardia circuit that I'm drawing has exclusive access to only one exit site, and there are no other bystander regions or slips of muscle that also exit via that same route. So when the VT happens, it necessarily will generate a QRS morphology of one type only. If you pace within this VT circuit, because it only has exclusive access to this one exit, you'll always generate the same QRS morphology as the VT itself. 
the only thing that will differ will be the stim to QRS time. If you pace from further away from the exit, it'll be a longer time between the stimulus artifact and the QRS onset. And if you pace close to the exit, you'll get a short stim to QRS time. The interesting thing about this hypothetical scenario is that anywhere you pace that generates the clinical QRS, you can successfully ablate this VT. That could either be within the circuit itself so that you're actually interrupting the circuit, or it could be that you're ablating near or at the exit site. And in that case, because there's no other exit accessible to this VT, you're also going to eliminate the ventricular tachycardia even if the circuit remains intact. It will have nowhere to go. You'll have trapped it within the scar. This is fascinating because when you think about multiple circuits within a region of SCAR and multiple potential exit sites, one ablation strategy that has been considered is called core isolation. And the principle there is if you target all of the potential exit sites around the periphery of the SCAR, then you may trap all of the VT circuits or potential circuits that lie within the SCAR and VT from this region will be eliminated. Let's continue thinking about myocardial SCAR and pacing and ventricular tachycardia, but now let's consider the possibility and likelihood that a particular circuit or pacing focus within the SCAR may find its way to more than one exit site at the border of the SCAR. Here again is our myocardial substrate. And here is our ventricular tachycardia generating that same QRS I've shown. And what if I pace at this location, but that wavefront is traveling out to a different border of the scar and generating a totally different QRS morphology with a delayed stim to QRS timing. I may be in the circuit, but if I'm escaping during pacing via a different route or even fusion, escaping from more than one exit site, then I will generate a QRS that does not match the VT, but could have been a perfectly good place to ablate and eliminate that VT circuit. It's interesting to note that VT circuits can often travel in both directions, clockwise and counterclockwise around that path. And it is frequently the case that when the circuit travels in one direction, it generates a QRS of one shape, but when it travels in an opposite direction, it generates a VT of another shape. So in this example, now that we're traveling clockwise around that same hypothetical VT circuit, we might actually exit out that other site where pacing exited, in which case you'd get a VT of a second morphology, but often of a similar cycle length that now matches this different pace map. This is known as having paired VTs. It's the same circuit, but two different directions and often two different ways of exiting the SCAR. So again, pacing within SCAR, generating a QRS that's different from a clinical VT does not mean that you're not in a relevant circuit. And if you see two VTs of a similar cycle length, then bear in mind that when you pace, you may generate a QRS of one or the other morphology. Let's think now back about output in the context of myocardial scar. We talked about capturing more myocardium simultaneously when you increase the pacing output, and this becomes extraordinarily relevant when you're in an area of scar. So for example, if you were to pace at high output with your catheter located on a critical part of this VT circuit, you may generate a very short stim to QRS in a totally different QRS morphology because you're not only capturing myocardial tissue within the scar, but you're capturing adjacent tissue from a totally different myocardial fiber strand that exits in a different way that has nothing to do with the VT circuit, but you are inadvertently capturing it at high output. What if you then dial down 
your output while continuing to pace at this same location. Well, now you may lose capture of that extra slip of muscle that was not relevant to the VT and instead only capture tissue immediately adjacent to the pacing electrode in the VT circuit. When this happens, you'll see two things, a sudden shift of the QRS morphology to match the VT morphology if it's exiting at the same site, and you'll see a sudden jump in the stim to QRS timing because now it takes much longer to get to that exit that's being used from this site instead of shortcutting and capturing other tissue that has a much closer access to a different border of the scar and therefore generates a much shorter stim to QRS timing from that other exit site. This reinforces how critically important it is in myocardial scar to pace just at capture threshold because you may have slips of muscle that are electrically very separate from each other, but geographically close. And the higher the output, the greater the chances that you're going to capture more than one area of local myocardial signal. And you may therefore exit different sites and give misleading results when you're pace mapping. You may be in this case at exactly the right site to ablate, but you'll see a wrong QRS and short stim to QRS timing if you pace at too high an output and may move on from a site that actually would have been perfect. In this case, if you just moved a small distance away from where you had just been pacing and pace now at low output, you'll generate that second irrelevant QRS morphology even at low output because now your catheter tip is immediately contiguous with that second adjacent fiber strand and it exits out that other shorter way. Let's look at a perfect example from that same anteroapical infarction patient that shows this principle very clearly. Here are four sites of pacing during sinus rhythm that generated four totally different QRS morphologies, even though these are fairly clustered together. Look, for example, at lead V1, where we have at sites one and three, more of a left bundle branch block morphology, and at sites two and four, more of a right bundle branch block morphology, and there are different stim to QRS timings. It's very hard to imagine how this is happening when you simply look at the voltage map with its color schemes. You're in an area of red. But if you change your mindset and think about scar slips and muscle slips and different ways of exiting, you can recognize that at each of these four sites, even though they are geographically close, if you're pacing just at threshold, which was done at each of these sites, you may well escape through different areas of the periphery of scar and approach the rest of the myocardium from a different angle, generating a different QRS. Here's another example from that same case that demonstrates exactly what can happen when you pace at higher output. Here, pacing at this site number one, we see a QRS morphology as shown on the left. If we move the catheter over to site two, we generate a very different morphology and have a longer stim to QRS time because we're a little deeper into the myocardial scar. Notice at site one, we have more of a left bundle branch block pattern. At site two, we have more of a right bundle branch block pattern. What if we stay at site two, but instead of pacing at the capture threshold, we crank up the output. Notice what happens. We've actually now not exactly replicated pacing at site one, but we've more closely approximated it. Look at lead V1, for example, where now we're back to a left bundle branch block morphology and a shorter stim to QRS time. The reason is now at high output, we're not only capturing the slip of muscle that is immediately underneath the pacing electrode, 
but we are capturing other fibers at a little further distance away with our virtual electrode at high output. And those other fibers are now escaping in a way that is different and shorter to get to the periphery of the scar edge. In this case, similar to how we exited when pacing at threshold at site one. Here's an example of pacing at the same output, the same site without moving the catheter and getting different QRS morphologies. In this case, the wavefront is propagating away from the catheter tip through several different muscle bundles, and it's a race to see which one reaches the periphery and generates a QRS first. And here, initially, it's of one morphology, and then it switches to another morphology, possibly because at this pacing rate, you've reached refractoriness in the first limb that was initially the fastest route to exit from SCAR, and now you're exiting through a different route, which takes a longer amount of time, but that tissue may not be refractory and able to keep up with the pacing rate. Again, a very important pitfall of using pace mapping to guide ablation when you're talking about myocardial SCAR because of the complexity of the way fibers are interconnected and the way they connect to the bulk of the myocardium at various locations at the periphery of SCAR. Lastly, I'd like to talk about functional block. And this concept in particular is relevant when we're talking about differences between entrainment mapping, pacing during VT, and pace mapping, pacing during sinus rhythm. Because in each case, even if you pace at exactly the same location, there may be strong implications about how wavefronts reach the scar periphery and generate a QRS on the surface EKG. Here we have zoomed in on myocardial scar, where tan regions denote electrically unexcitable scar tissue, fibrosis, and we have a VT circuit that is enclosed within the bounds of this scar with entrance and exit sites as seen. So in order to initiate VT, we have a wavefront that enters the scar. It conducts down one of the two limbs called unidirectional block because the other limb wasn't ready at the time that signal entered the region of scar. And I'm now gonna use red color to denote tissue that was just depolarized and remains refractory. So this wavefront travels around this limb of the circuit, and it exits at the other side of the scar, seen here in the bottom right, and it generates a QRS from that site. And now the bulk of myocardium is depolarized, generating the surface QRS. So now the other limb of the circuit has recovered, and the wavefront can travel back up that limb, However, the entrance where the initial signal had entered and initiated this reentry circuit is now not accessible for exit. And the reason is that the myocardium outside was just depolarized in the form of the QRS. The exit site on the opposite side had traveled all the way around, and now we have refractory tissue in the bulk of the myocardium. So now this has become inaccessible as an exit, and I'd call this functional block. However, the initial limb that the signal traveled down has now recovered, so this wavefront can travel back down that limb, creating sustained ventricular tachycardia over and over with an exit site that is only at one end of the scar, and the yellow arrows here signify the way the bulk of myocardium is depolarized and the way a QRS is generated. If we were to pace during sinus rhythm at the exit, we're going to similarly generate a QRS that matches the QRS from the VT. It may not be the best site for ablation, but it replicates the way the bulk of myocardium is depolarized. If we pace from a critical isthmus, that would be a perfect place to ablate. If we pace during ventricular tachycardia, 
meaning we've entrained the tachycardia and we're pacing a little faster while the tachycardia is ongoing, then the wavefront that we will generate will be identical to that that is occurring during the VT, meaning the wavefront will travel down to the bottom right of the screen, it will exit the scar in the same way and generate exactly the same QRS. When that paced wavefront travels retrograde back up toward the start, it will meet refractory tissue the same way I showed before during the VT itself. That same principle holds during entrainment pacing and the signal will come round and will pace the next time a little bit ahead of when that signal would have reached that same pacing site. So entrainment pacing will generate the same QRS if you're pacing from a critical isthmus. And that's a very critical principle when you're doing entrainment mapping and interpreting it. However, if we were to pace from that same site during sinus rhythm, then we're not going to have this issue of functional block, but instead we're going to be able to exit from both sides of the scar and will generate a surface QRS shown with the yellow arrows that is a fusion between the two exit sites that are now accessible when we pace during sinus rhythm, when we perform pace mapping in this area of scar. This is a critical principle to understand because I showed you before how if you were in a bystander site within scar, you could pace during pace mapping techniques and generate an identical QRS as the VT, have a long stim to QRS, but be at the totally wrong site for ablation. This is the opposite. You're at the totally right site for ablation, but when you pace, you generate a completely different QRS morphology, and you may falsely conclude that you're not at a good site. Here's a wonderful example from Mark Josephson that demonstrates exactly this last principle. The top EKG here shows the clinical ventricular tachycardia, and the bottom EKG shows entrainment pacing from a critical isthmus. You can look at all of the leads yourself, but you'll see, and I've highlighted lead one to demonstrate this, that the QRS is exactly replicated during entrainment pacing. And there's a long or medium long stim to QRS timing. This meets the criteria, at least on the surface, for entrainment pacing in a critical isthmus. If instead you pace during sinus rhythm, meaning pace mapping, from this critical isthmus where one burn would terminate this VT, you'll see a totally different QRS morphology. And again, I only need to show you lead one to demonstrate this. It has a completely different axis and morphology in that and most of the leads. And the reason again is you're getting both anterograde and retrograde conduction out both the entrance and the exit site now functioning both as exit sites during pacing, you don't get functional block at the entrance slash alternate exit site as you do during the VT and during entrainment pacing. So you're at the precisely right location for ablation, but pace mapping is extraordinarily misleading because it'll give you a very different QRS morphology. So you shouldn't be fooled. Again, this is a phenomenon that occurs with myocardial scar where pacing from one location can potentially exit in more than one remote site, generating a fused or a different QRS that doesn't exactly tell you where you're pacing from because of that disconnect between pacing site and activation of the bulk of myocardium. So what have we learned as we think back about the mechanisms of how pace mapping works and think about the various clinical scenarios where it may be employed, sometimes with great accuracy and sometimes less so? Here are some of the basic principles I think that we've reviewed. 
Number one, pace mapping is more reliable when you're dealing with normal myocardium because wavefronts propagate out from the pacing site in a predictable fashion without dealing with myocardial scar barriers, without dealing with slips of muscle in areas of infarction or other scar where the pacing site is connected to the bulk of myocardium through one or more channels with varying conduction velocities and unpredictable conduction routes. But even in normal myocardium, you have to think about the irregular nature of the surface, such as when ridges are present, which is basically all of the endocardium of both ventricles, but in particular when you're dealing with papillary muscle and cases where you're at the most prominent inflection points of tissue. If the electrode is in contact with more than one surface, beware, especially at higher output, that you may capture more than one location at once and generate a resulting fused QRS that may not match the clinical QRS even if your catheter tip is in contact with the site of origin at one point. Next, you should always pace at the capture threshold. That means that when you're pace mapping at each location, you should turn down the output until you lose capture and evaluate the QRS morphology right before capture was lost. This is particularly critical when you're dealing with inflection points of tissue, when you're dealing with myocardial scar, anywhere where if you captured a larger bulk of muscle, you may generate a wavefront that is very different at high output compared to the low output capture. You should also pace at a similar coupling interval to the tachycardia that you're mapping or the PVC that you're searching for because when you pace faster or slower you may find the QRS is a little bit different due to refractoriness or differences in how signals propagate at that speed of pacing. When you're dealing with fascicular VT, it's better to do activation mapping of the earliest Purkinje potential because if you're pacing on top of Purkinje fibers, you're likely to also capture local myocardium, which doesn't get initially activated during the clinical PVCs or VT, but will fuse when you're doing pacing and therefore you may be at the correct site and you may generate a QRS that doesn't quite match the clinical VT. In areas of SCAR, a QRS perfect match does not necessarily mean that you are in the right spot for ablation, even if it's a long stem to QRS time. And conversely, if you have a mismatch between the paced QRS during pace mapping and the clinical VT, it does not mean you're at the wrong spot because of the possibility that during pacing you may exit out more than one site, whereas during VT you may have functional block at one of the exits and exit only from the other direction. And it's critical, as always in the EP lab, to remember that you have many tools at your disposal and pace mapping is just one of them. So entrainment mapping, activation mapping, and other techniques are critical to use because pace mapping is not always going to be reliable and it's always great to, first of all, practice with other techniques, but also get confirmation that the conclusions that you're drawing using one technique are supported and confirmed by another. Thank you so much and I very much hope that this was helpful.